So a hormone is a chemical messenger moving in the bloodstream. Hormones are produced by glands in response to chemical stimuli. They can be either fast or slow acting. And the job of hormones is to maintain a constant environment inside the body despite outside changes. So the picture on the right is a picture of thyroid hormones in the thyroid gland. So those tan colored things <laughs> is thyroid hormone. It's interesting eh, to see what it looks like. Hormonal secretions can be rhythmic like estrogen and progesterone that follow the lunar cycle. They can be instantaneous like adrenaline, the, which is one of the fight or flight hormones that we'll secrete as needed quickly. Or they can be active over long periods of time like growth hormone. So growth hormone is high in infancy, it's high again in puberty when we go through growth spurts. One thing you really is very important to know is that hormones only act when they bind to a receptor. So a hormone by itself won't do anything unless it attaches to a receptor. This is very, very, very important to understand why certain environmental chemicals or certain foods are either protective or not um, for breast cancer. So that's important. So a receptor has an affinity for particular hormones. So there'll be a receptor for estrogen, a receptor for progesterone, a special receptor for melatonin, and a receptor for insulin. And these hormones have to bind to those receptors to act. But those receptors may also allow other things that aren't hormones to bind to them. Like xenoestrogens. Somebody name a xenoestrogen. Plastic. What else? Pesticides. Chlorine. Anything with chlorine. Solvents, detergents, PCBs, dioxin. You're gonna, you get along. You don't need to write these down. You've got them all in your book. But those are the xenoestrogens, the the chemicals in the environment that actually don't look much like estrogen, but they have a little piece on them that's similar to the part of the estrogen molecule that binds to the receptor. So they can bind to the receptor, and and just like estrogen binds to the receptor. And generally, they're weak. They're not as strong as estrogen, but the trouble is, for the environmental estrogens, the problem is the body doesn't break them down very easily because they're new. We didn't evolve with them. They've been around only the last 40 years. The liver doesn't really know what to do with them, and so they accumulate in the breast tissue or in the body, in the fat cells. And they have a, um, they can be two xenoestrogens mm. together, two pesticides together, can be a thousand times stronger in its estrogenic effect than one alone. So they accumulate and they have a synergistic effect. The phytoestrogens, on the other hand, are weak and the body knows what to do with them, right? They will attach to the receptor and then they will it'll be broken down and then they'll be utilized or eliminated. Um, and so they're generally not a problem. But they're helpful. Why are they helpful? Because they block. Because something has to attach to that receptor. The receptor is there. It's either going to be your body's estrogen, or it's going to be the xenoestrogens, the harmful ones that are synergistic. They stay there for the rest of your life unless you have a sauna. Or it's going to be the phytoestrogens. So of all those three, which ones do you want to attach to the receptor? The phytoestrogens, right? So that's where a lot of confusion lies. Yeah. Yeah, this is why I'm being very precise with it now. And we'll talk more and more about it later. And there are some parameters that you need to understand. But generally, the phytoestrogens are protective. The xenoestrogens are not. And the body's estrogens are, um, some are protective and some are not. And we'll get into that in a minute. So the hormone affects the cell nucleus. The hormone plus the receptor. <coughs> affects the cell nucleus to create a specific protein, which is an enzyme with a specific characteristic action. And the enzyme action causes a shift in the body's metabolism. So name one action of estrogen. Can anyone name one action of estrogen? What's that? Yeah. So estrogen causes cells to divide more quickly. That's one of the things it does. 
And so that's not a great thing when there's cancer present because the cell, if there's cancer present, is going to grow more quickly. And that's why some of you who were estrogen receptor dominant, we know that estrogen is part of what's driving or was part of what was driving the growth of the cancer. And so part of the um, uh, therapy is to, is to block estrogen or eliminate estrogen, reduce estrogen, so that it no longer will cause growth or multiplication of cells. How do you find out if you're estrogen receptor dominant? Is that uh, estrogen receptor positive, that would be part of the biopsy. Part of yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or, or the pathology. Actually, the pathology report yeah, usually. Pathology. Yeah. Always. So here's a little diagram of the hormone at the top, attaching to a receptor, the the sideways E, and those two things forming the hormone receptor complex and then entering the nucleus of the cell, activating the DNA to create a protein which is an enzyme which causes a shift in metabolism, a particular action. So every hormone has a different sort of action. So here's a di diagram of the glandular system. So we see if we go from the top down that the, um, the hypothalamus is, is in the brain there and the hypothalamus is is really the master controller of the whole glandular system because it sends, it measures um, the um, constituents of the blood to sort of evaluate all the hormone levels in the blood. And it also receives messages from pretty much all parts of the brain that tell it about your emotional state, your mental emotional state. Depending on the mental emotional state, and the um, chemistry of the blood, it will um, determine the amounts of releasing hormones that then go to the pituitary gland, which is A. So you can write pituitary beside A. So the hypothalamus talks to the pituitary and says, make some uh, thyroid stimulating hormone. And then the thyroid stimulating hormone from the pituitary circulates through the body and, and through the blood and tells the thyroid gland in the throat to make more thyroid hormones. So the, the sequence of events is first the hypothalamus acts first, then the pituitary, and then messages from the pituitary go to most of the other glands. And B is the pineal gland. There also is a relationship between the pituitary and the pineal gland it isn't very well understood yet, but the pineal gland is the master biological clock of the body, so it's regulating all the rhythms of the body. And the pineal gland is regulated by light and dark. So the rhythms of the pineal are dependent on our exposure to light and dark, including the light of the moon. So it's actually the pineal that, and the light of the moon affecting the pineal and the hypothalamus that uh, regulates the whole menstrual cycle. So you can see when women are taken away from that natural cycle of, of having the light of the moon the way we're supposed to, that the whole hormonal system is going to be a little bit messed up. You see, we have to either we have to either be out in the in the moonlight, or we have to mimic that sort of light in our bedrooms. You know, so one way that women can regulate their menstrual cycles if they live in cities and they don't have access to the moonlight <laughs> is to have a, a little nightlight on in their bedroom that's about as bright as the moonlight, the day before the, uh, the full moon, the day of the full moon, the day after the full moon, so that we have that monthly rhythm set by light. <laughs> 